Merry Christmas City Life. So great to be here with you. Thanks for joining us. I hope you and your family are enjoying the holiday season. If we haven't met yet, my name is Daryl, and I'm so excited for what we're going to experience together. Also want to give a huge shout out to our first time guests. Man, thank you guys for tuning in and being here with us today. Hey guys, we have a lot in store for you. Look out for the snowman that's going to be popping up on the screen. This is super fun. See how many you can catch. And at the end of our service, see if you got that answer right. Question for you guys. I know it's Christmas season. What's your favorite holiday dessert? Sweet potato pie right here. For those who don't know, that's Pumpkin's Cousin. Come on. <laughs> Man. And guess what, guys? We will be joining and returning right here next Sunday. Kicking off 21 days of prayer. Can't wait for that. City Life, I just want to take the moment to thank you for your radical generosity. I also want to give you a reminder that we have up to this Friday for our end of the year gift to count towards our Kingdom Builders Friday. We thank you for your radical generosity. And now, let's take a moment to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Hey, I don't know about you, but it's been a crazy season. Christmas, kids, gifts, all those things, planning dinners and all. But let's just quiet our hearts and minds right now and allow Jesus to meet us right where we are as we worship and praise him.
We are so thankful for you today and every day. We honor you, we adore you, and we thank you so much for your beautiful presence. In your name, amen.
Merry Christmas, City Life fam. I hope you had an amazing Christmas celebration, that you enjoyed your family and friends, and that you ate a lot of cookies. We've been in a series this December called The Thrill of Hope, and I want to wrap up that series today with a simple message I've titled, God is Still in Control. And I want to tell you what I think is probably my favorite Christmas story about a man named Simeon. After Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph traveled to Jerusalem to worship and to have him circumcised and dedicated at the temple. And that's where we meet Simeon. Luke chapter 2, verse 25 says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So we learn a few things in these verses about Simeon. First, he was at the end of his life. He'd lived a full life, and by the time Joseph and Mary arrived in Jerusalem with Jesus, he was at the end of his life. We also learn that he was godly. The Bible describes him as righteous and devout and says that the Holy Spirit was on him. So he loved God, he worshiped God, he'd been faithful to God throughout his life. And then he was waiting. And so he was waiting for something to happen. Specifically, he was waiting for what the Bible calls the consolation of Israel. And there was a personal dimension to this. It's the picture of a man at the end of his life who's lived a good life and experienced difficulty, who's just waiting for one more thing to happen with this belief, this conviction, that if I could just see this one thing happen before I die, then my life will feel complete. But there's also a larger dimension to this as well. He wasn't just waiting for God to do something for him, but for his people, the consolation of Israel. So Israel as a people and a nation had experienced a lot of suffering. They'd been oppressed, but God had made them these promises. Specifically, God had promised to send someone, a deliverer called the Messiah. In the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures were filled with messianic prophecies that predicted the arrival of this Savior. And so for people like Simeon, these prophecies inspired hope that God had a plan and that in spite of their suffering, God was going to send someone who would bring salvation and establish a new kingdom and usher in a new day. And so there are more than 60 prophecies in the Old Testament about the Messiah, about who he would be and what he would do. And I want to just review a few of these just to give you a sense of what Simeon was waiting for at the end of the life of his life. Number one, it says that the Messiah would be a male. Secondly, that the Messiah would be born from the family of Abraham. Uh, now, Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. The prophecy said specifically he would come from the line of Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. The prophecy said specifically he would come from the line of Jacob. Then Jacob had 12 sons, and the prophecies say specifically he would come from the line of Judah, one of the 12. So these prophecies, they're starting to narrow down the list. The prophecy said that the Messiah's mother would be a virgin, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. That one comes from Micah 5 verse 2, 700 years before Jesus was even born. We were told exactly where Jesus would be born, in this tiny rural town of Bethlehem. The Messiah would spend time as a refugee in Egypt. The Messiah would grow up in Nazareth, another small, tiny, rural village. These are some of the prophecies that the Messiah would never sin, that the Messiah would visit the temple. Now, this one's an amazing prophecy because in Malachi 3, it was 400 years before Jesus was born. This prophecy was given, but here's why it's so amazing. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So now there's basically a deadline to the arrival of the Messiah. There hasn't been a temple for the last 2,000 years. So the Messiah had to come before 70 AD. Here's another one, that the Messiah would perform many miracles, that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem on a donkey while people cheered his entry, that the Messiah would be betrayed by a close friend, that would betray him literally with 30 pieces of silver is what Zechariah 11 says. So the number of the coins are actually named. And it says that the Messiah, that uh, rather the traitor would throw the coins in disgust back into the temple. And so there's a second confirmation of the temple deadline of 70 AD. It's amazing. The Messiah would be beaten and spit upon. The Messiah would not defend himself. The Messiah would be crucified. Psalm 22 gives that prophecy. 1,000 years before Jesus was born, but even more amazingly, a few hundred years before crucifixion was even invented. 
Not only was his crucifixion prophesied, this psalm specifically says that nails would be driven into the Messiah's hands and his feet. That the Messiah would be crucified with sinners. The Messiah would be buried with the rich. That he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb. These were the prophecies. That the Messiah would be resurrected from the dead. And so when you put it all together, here's what Simeon at the end of his life is waiting for. He's waiting for a boy whose mom would be a virgin, who would also be from the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, who would be born in Bethlehem, spend some time as a refugee in Egypt, and then grow up in Nazareth. That as he grew up, he would perform hundreds of miracles, never sin, and visit the temple before 70 AD. That he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey while people cheered his entry, and then be betrayed by a close friend for exactly 30 pieces of silver, which would be eventually returned in disgust, to the temple again before 70 AD. Simeon was waiting for a man who would be beaten, spit upon, crucified with sinners, executed without ever trying to defend himself, and then buried in a rich man's tomb before coming back from the dead altogether. (laughs) Now I want to ask you a question. Have you ever found yourself hoping and waiting for something to happen that was a little outside of your control? I mean, maybe right now you're waiting and hoping for a new job opportunity. But the harder you try to get your resume out there and fill out applications and network and interview, the more you're realizing, I don't think I can make this happen. Or maybe you're waiting and hoping to have a baby or a dating relationship or some relief in your health or clarity about an important decision that you're trying to make. Or maybe for you, it's just the uncertainty in our world today that has you on edge, feeling a little out of control. I think all of us had hoped that by the end of 2021, this pandemic would be over, that mass would be behind us, that life would feel more normal. But the reality is we still don't know how long this is all gonna last, how effective the vaccines are gonna be, what more changes are waiting for us in 2022, how different our world is gonna be when it's all finally said and done. And I think we can all probably agree it's not a fun feeling when life feels out of control. What we feel when we lose a sense of control is a sense of powerlessness And what we all tend to do in different ways, regardless of our personality type, when we feel powerless is to grasp for control. In fact, here are just some of the ways that we try to get control of our lives and our world. See if you can relate to any of these. Blaming. (laughs) If we can find a scapegoat to blame our uncertainty on, then we can feel like we have some control of the situation. Magical thinking is another one. Man, if I just take this pill or believe this message or drink this mix, you know, or believe that none of this is real, that it's just being made up by somebody to control me, because if we can believe a fantasy, then we can feel in more control of reality. Prediction is another one. What's going to happen is, and we just kind of fill in the blank, when the truth is we don't really know what's going to happen. Our prediction is just one of many possibilities, and even the experts themselves don't really know what's ahead of us. But we pretend to know, and we work up some confidence in our predictions, because if we can predict the future, we can feel more in control of what's going to happen. Reading the news is another one. If you find yourself reading the news four, five, six, seven times a day, because, man, if we can know the future, we can feel in control of the future. Obsessive behavior, things like dieting or exercise, cleaning, organizing your closet, these are all good things. But at times, we get a little carried away because when we don't feel like we have control of the future, we want to create some domain in our lives, even if it's my closet, where I can control every detail of what's happening. Tyrannical relationships. Sometimes we can just get a little controlling, let's be honest, and tyrannical with our kids, a roommate, a spouse, because if we can't control the future, If we can't control current events, if we can't control our jobs, our own lives, maybe we can control them. But the common denominator, listen, in all of these examples, it's a futile attempt to control something that's totally outside of our control. Listen, we can't control current events. We can't control government policy. We can't control vaccine effectiveness. We can't control our health. We can't control our finances. We can't control our careers. We can't control our kids. And I could go on and on and on. Now we can influence all of these things, in small ways and at times big ways, but even as we do everything we can to influence whatever it is that's the source of our dreams, the source of our hopes, our fears, our anxieties, we can't control them. So what are we supposed to do? I want to tell you the end of this story, but first let me just make one more observation. There are a few different perspectives that people have of how history works. Think about this. 
There are some people who believe that life is nothing more than a random series of events that, you know, one right after the other that are purely coincidental. So one day just turns into another day, but it's not really going anywhere on purpose and nobody's really in charge. So life is just a collection of meaningless events that don't really uh, have a larger purpose. Stuff just happens for no apparent reason and there's really no organizing thread behind it. And then there are others who teach that God is kind of like a clockmaker who put the world together and then step back to just watch it tick. They say that he's not really involved, he's just kind of indifferent watching everything unfold. But neither of these views is what scripture teaches. And neither of these views is what Simeon believed. He had a very different take on history. Listen, he believed that life is going somewhere, that this world was going somewhere, that his life was a piece of a larger puzzle that God was putting together, that God was uh, intimately involved in his life and that God's intimately involved in our world. He believed that God had a plan. He believed that at the right time, God was going to accomplish his plan and fulfill his promises. So let's look at the end of the story, Luke 2, verse 27. It says, He came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. So here is Simeon, and he's just holding on. He's at the end of his life, and against all odds, he never loses faith, never gives up on the hope that God would give him his consolation. And finally, after years of waiting, he holds Jesus the Messiah, in his arms. And he says, for years I have hoped for this day, and now my eyes have seen it. Seen what? Seen proof that God is in control of history. Proof that all the waiting was worth it. Proof that hope dis that, that's placed in God's word never disappoints. And here's what Simeon realized as he held Jesus in his hands and what we realize as we put ourselves in his shoes today. God is in control. He's not the watchmaker. He didn't create this world only to step back and watch it self-destruct. He's not disinterested or disengaged, and neither is this world just a collection of random and meaningless events. Instead, God is in control, and we know that because of the proof of history. Jesus was born to a virgin from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the small town of Bethlehem. And he did, in fact, travel with Joseph and Mary as a refugee to Egypt and then back to Nazareth where he grew up. Jesus did start his ministry at 30 years of age by performing hundreds of miracles. He did visit the temple before 70 AD. He did enter Jerusalem on a donkey while people cheered his entry. He was betrayed by Judas, his close friend, for exactly 30 pieces of silver. And Judas did return the money to the temple in disgust. Jesus was spit upon and beaten and crucified with sinners and executed without ever trying to defend himself. And Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb before coming out of that tomb and rising from the dead altogether. God is in control. And even in the face of world-shaping events, God was able to use them to accomplish his purposes. I mean, just take three of the prophecies that predicted where Jesus would be early in his life. That he'd be born in Bethlehem, spend time in Egypt, and grow up in Nazareth. Think about what had to happen on the international scene in order for those three prophecies to be realized. Jesus was born in Bethlehem because Caesar ordered a census. His family wasn't from Beth Bethlehem. But since God rules over human history, the governor asked for a census to make sure that everybody was on the tax rolls. And as a result, they all had to go to their hometown of origin. Jesus' adopted dad, Joseph, was from the lineage of David. David's hometown was Bethlehem. And so at just the time, Mary was ready to give birth. Think about it. They arrived there for the census. And just like Micah prophesied, Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem. Jesus fled to Egypt because of a threat that came from the king. And then they came back to Nazareth where Jesus ended up growing up, a small rural town in Palestine. And the reason they came to Nazareth instead of settling in Judah was because Herod put his son Archelaus in charge of the land of Judah. And Archelaus was crazy. He was a murderer and he killed about 3,000 Jews at one time. 
So Matthew's gospel says that God warned Joseph in a dream of what Archelaus was doing. And so Joseph got up and moved with his family to Nazareth. And all three pieces of the location puzzle came together geographically. I'm just saying, God is in control. And here's what all of these promises and prophecies reveal about God. And this is why Simeon was so wise to put his hope and his trust in God, because God knew the future. Even when sin first entered the world, he knew at that point that he would send Jesus as a baby to make things right. And then God announced the future through all of these prophecies, hundreds of them. God revealed exactly what his plan was. And then God orchestrated events in order to bring to pass his foreknowledge and plan. And what all of that reveals to us today is so important and it is so comforting and it is so faith building to declare and trust that God is in control. I don't know what's going to happen in our world in 2022. I don't know what's going to happen in your life next year. Some things are going to happen that were part of your plan, but I can guarantee you other things will happen that were not a part of your plan that will surprise you. Detours are going to occur. And when they do, you'll be tempted to fear, to worry, to try to control things you can't control. And when those moments come, here's my prayer, that you'll remember you're not in control, and that's okay, because God is still in control. There is nothing that will happen in your life next year that will be a surprise to God. Just let that sink in for a minute. Nothing. He knows what's coming, and he knows his plan for you. And he knows how to use everything that's going to happen in order to accomplish his plan for you and for our world. And so instead of worrying, you can worship him. And instead of wearing yourself out trying to control everything, you can relax and you can rest in him. And instead of trying to predict the future, you can trust him with the future. You know, Christmas, it makes promises it can't deliver. Christmas is a romantic, sentimental season, and I'll be the first one to line up and say, I love it. I love all of it. I really do. We decorate our house early. We go all out. I'm playing the music in November. I'm into it. I love Christmas morning, but I've experienced the same thing for over 40 years now. When it's all over, a little let down. Maybe you're feeling that today. Something I was hoping for under the tree, maybe it was there, maybe it wasn't there, but the feeling doesn't last. And parents, you know this even more if you have kids because we work so hard to get our kids the perfect present, just what they want, and they open it, and sometimes they cry, and they jump, and they, we get it on video, and it's awesome. And then what are they saying like three hours later, before the day is even over? Dad, I'm bored. What can I do? There's nothing to do. Like, seriously? <laughs> And listen, if you're feeling disappointment in your life today, disappointment is a spiritual MRI that reveals to us where we've misplaced our hope. And so scripture gives us a better option. Instead of putting our hope in Christmas or a vacation or a career change or a move or some other dream or plan, we have a better hope. He's called a living hope. And Peter says this in the New Testament about the living hope, it doesn't disappoint. What's a living hope? It's a hope that breathes, a hope that has a name, a hope that was literally born into our world as a baby and grew into a man. He is our hope. He is your hope, not something that he taught him, not just something he did him. He is our hope and he will always deliver on his promises to you. How do I know that? Because God is still in control. And I just want to leave you with this final promise. Let this soak deep into your heart and mind right now. Psalm 62 verse 5 says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you that in the midst of this Christmas season and as we finish one year and get ready to start another one, we don't have to fear the future. Because we know you're in control. You know what's going to happen. You know what's coming around the corner. And I pray today that you would give us a gift that money can't buy. The ability to trust you and to be filled with peace. Knowing that you are in control of history and you're in control of our lives. Thank you, God. Amen.
much for joining us. It's been so great to worship with you. And now for the big reveal. Uh, those of you who are counting the snowmen, get ready. How many did you find? Well, the answer is there are 11 snowmen. So go ahead and put it in the chat if you got it right. Um, congratulations. And we just want to wish you a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and thanks again for joining us.